All righty. All right, well, come on and let's start our session. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the 44th Annual Caller Lab Convention in Mesa, Arizona. Today's Tuesday, April the 11th. And uh, this is the name of this session is uh, Sanding Your Edges or Smooth Calling and Dancing. Um, my name is Mike Seastrom. I'm from Los Angeles, California. My two panelists to uh, my left, your right up in here, is Jerry Junk. And Jerry is from uh, Wayne, Nebraska and Mesa, Arizona. And uh, also a, a past chairman of Caller Lab and a credited caller coach. To his left is John Marshall. John's from Sterling, Virginia. And uh, uh, also a past chairman of Caller Lab. And as I'm, yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of us past here. Huh? A few, a few pasts. Anyway, we're, we're glad to be here. First of all, let me thank you for attending. This is one of the last sessions in our whole convention, and the fact that you're still vertical and your eyes are still open. And if you do uh, nap a little bit during the session, we totally understand uh, you deserve it. So go right ahead. If you start to snore, the person next to you is going to elbow you. So um, we just want to make that perfectly clear. You know, we're excited about this particular session because the three of us have the same kind of passion for the dance experience that I know many of you do, and there's a lot of the callers out there that have that same that same feel for it. We have shifted from uh, um, watching that little dot go around the turntable um, to looking at the um, number of beats per minute that occurs on our computers, and or um, or just having to feel for it. I know Jerry works off of a of a uh, iPad, iPod, sort of, and and still in, in calling with him, I know that he just intuitively knows the number of beats, and he watches those dancers out there as those dancers dance. And I encourage every one of you to not necessarily look at what's on your computer all the time, because it may vary a little bit, and depending on what your programming use. I once had a gentleman come to my dance, and he popped up to me the, after, right after the first tip, and he says that was 128 bits, beats a minute. And he had this metronome, this digital metronome in his hand. And I knew, looking down at my, I started it out, this was 124 I was calling at. He said, oh, you're using Square View. I said, yes, I do use Square View. He says, yes, Square View tends to run about four beats fast. The first thing I said to him, are you a caller? He says, no, I just love this stuff, though. And he's got this. So so I want you to know that, that what's on your computer might ne not necessarily be in actuality what's happening out there. What I think is really critical for you to do, and I'm going to stress this just off the top, is that watch the dancer's feet. They're going to tell you exactly that your tempo is too fast or too slow. Watch them. If somebody's going like this to try to catch up, or you've got dancers that are just stepping every other step because it's too hard to keep up with what you're doing, you're just calling too fast. Your tempo is too fast. That doesn't make it a better caller. It, 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 it just makes the dance experience a lot lower for your, your audience out there, and people are walking out the door before the end of the dance. So varying your tempo a little bit is, is fine, but running it up, um, unless you're calling hot hash or some other kind of thing, I think you need to watch those dancers' feet. They're going to tell you. And if you're, a lot of times, there's a lot of us, particularly when it's warmer out there, watch the glow in their forehead. When, that, when their, their forehead starts glowing away and they begin to um, glow um, or perspire, in the case of some of us, um, <laughs> cut out the pattern. Don't keep going and going and going and going. So I think um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to John and let John start. Um, this afternoon's session. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to follow in just for a moment on what Mike had to say. A couple of other things you want to watch for on that, aside from things like your floor surface, what are we dancing on, carpet, you know, tile, whatever, makes a difference too. Uh, your age group can make a difference on that as well. If I'm calling teens, if I'm calling the seniors, whatever. Um, it was very last about that. Well, so many of them are all seniors. Well, there's, you know, there's, there's a difference. And, uh, you also sometimes you have a group, maybe you have a, uh, some semi handy capable people and they're walking wounded, I talk about. They've come back from surgery or whatever. Um, I might make it a point to uh, adjust my tempo a little bit for them if necessary. But also um, this thing about, uh, Mike mentioned about metronome. Uh, no, it's not digital, but if you've been calling a long time, you know. You may not even be able to get, assign a number to it, but you know that it feels right. You know that it's right for the floor. 
Also, uh, you mentioned about people trying to catch up or taking the long steps, whatever. Um, in addition to the idea that maybe it's not your tempo, maybe you let the swears get too big. Uh, we tend to forget to remind dancers about that. Um, sadly, as we have bigger rooms and smaller numbers, you know, it can happen. So there's elements that, <clears throat> that play into this. But uh, smooth dancing to me and body flow that we're going to talk about here, they are so vital. Uh, I, I want to get a pin printed up that says, you know, don't stop, go. I am so sick and tired of watching callers present to dancers as stop and go, stop and go. For one thing, as a dancer, it's exhausting compared to dancing smooth flowing material, one call following the other, right? And you need to be on top of your game to do that. You need to know where you're headed to do that. And and quite frankly, uh, it, it's it's pointless to me to do the stop and go business. If, if, you, if you're calling too hard and you have to keep stopping, then you're calling too hard for the floor. And I'm talking irregardless of what it said on the door walking in, whether it was plus or plus DVD or mainstream, irregardless. You know, there's something wrong. They're breaking down. And it could well be the tempo. They're just not prepared for the choreography. So it's that blend of the choreography that you choose along with the flow. If I'm looking for a flat-out straight, what I call a flow tip, I want them all to flow. But if I want it to be a special experience to where the dancers are done, they come up to me at the end of the tip, and I often save it for the last tip of the night, if the floor is deserving, if, they're, if they've proven themselves to be able to dance that way, to, you know, rather than dance continuous all night long nonstop, most of our floors won't do it anymore. They can't. But uh, bottom line is that somebody come, people come up to me at the end of the dance and say, wow. That really made me feel like a dancer. And they emphasize that word, dancer. And I'm, I, I shoot for that all the time because it makes such a difference to their experience. And they can't wait to get more of it. And that keeps people coming back. Um, but it makes you more successful. And so the elements that both Jerry and I and, and uh, what's his name down the end of the Oh, yeah, Mike, uh, are, gonna, are going to be uh, talking about are elements that make up for that. Um, Choosing music that promotes dancing to rhythm. How many people were in here for the last session in this room? Anybody? Okay, this will follow on just a little bit on what you heard in there. But I believe, number one, to do your best calling, the music that you select needs to speak to you personally. It needs to be music that you feel uh, not only just good about, but somebody else may use a piece of music, and you love that piece of music. You might love it, but you may not be able to fit to it. But the ones that really strike you right, that you can relate to and call well to, that's where you're going to get your best combinations for flow. Uh, I think that makes a big difference, choosing that music and and ability to dance to the rhythm. When I put on a piece of music and I look around the room, even if it's that piece of music I put on when I'm getting the people squared up and I start watching, there's some people still sitting on the side. I watch. Are they tamping their foot yet? Are they aware? Do they become physically aware of what's going on? Now, I agree, you have to also, it's good to vary you know, your music during the evening, not only by genre necessarily, but uh, by rhythm. Uh, we don't have a lot of material in like six, eight rhythms, but uh, the other more common rhythm, the two, four, and so on, that allows us to get in and out of our pattern quickly, those things uh, are, are good to have to the program. But it's still, it has to dance. And you know, folks, this applies to singing calls too. There are some singing calls that will, uh, be usable, and they're quite often very familiar singing calls. There was a version of uh, Danny Boy years ago that came out, and it was a great piece of music, but it didn't dance with a hoot. You know, it was not good to dance to. Now, the caller using it happened to be able to sell anything. I mean, ice cream to Eskimos. You know, he was a tremendous talent. He had tremendous styling abilities. Uh, he was an exciting caller, and he could make that work. But he's certainly by far the exception. Uh, and I wouldn't want to dance to things that don't dance all night long. Um, and you need to call to the music. The uh, I know a few callers out there that they have their own world. You know, they're running at 132, sometimes 138. It doesn't matter because they don't call to the music. So you have to choose as a dancer: Am I going to dance to the music, or am I going to dance to the caller? And that's exhausting, also. That's really tiring. I'm wondering what I'm getting written here. Background. Ah. Thank you. Jerry wrote a little note to me about background noise. 
<clears throat> that can interfere with things. Is that what you're talking about? No. All oh, the background music was background noise. I see. Uh, in, that, in that example, he's right. It is. It was irrelevant to what was being called. Um, I know uh, one caller who uses that approach, but to him, and he stops after almost every call. But sometimes the answers needed. Sometimes they don't. That's his sense, but he believes it gives, I think, I don't know this, but I believe he thinks that it ends a sense of movement to the room, uh, to the floor, a sense of urgency, if not if not at least movement, by having it there without regard to the tempo. And uh, I won't do many personal stories today. I don't want to take the time for it, but the best one I know of that is this caller had a mentor, uh, was mentoring another caller who I happened to have a private lunch with one day, and... Uh, we were talking about it, and he was talking about his calling, and he was struggling a bit. His dancers were not, not handling it well. And uh, I asked him, uh, what are your tempos? And he quoted his mentor. He was calling tempos the same way his mentor was. And I said, uh, <clears throat> I've heard you call a little bit. You've know, you got a nice sound. Your material's fine. Um, just go back in and back your music off you know, to about 124, 126. And he said, that's extreme. I said, yes, it is. But watch the smoothness in the floor. The dancers will smooth right out for you, and the calls you're calling, they're going to be able to do, I suspect, because you're not calling tricky stuff. And I think you're going to be able to be successful with that. Go back and try it and let me know. Don't tell your mentor about this conversation. (laughs) Because I didn't want to get a phone call from the mentor being upset with me that he didn't think I was doing right. But uh, my answer would have been, I'm just trying to do what I think might help this guy because he's, he's deserving of some help. Uh, I did later find out he did make the adjustment, and it made a big difference in the success of the dancers. And many times, that's all it takes. Sometimes it's just two beats. Just some two to four beats can make a big, big difference. Um, tempo, comfortable number of beats, and that's what we're talking about, what's comfortable in number of beats that they're dancing. And that internal metronome really does exist. I mean, you go over to the record vendor and drop a piece of music on, and right away, you know, you're going to react to the tempo and think about it. There's also some pieces of music that you hear that you think you're okay, but there's something wrong. Try slowing them down. Sometimes that piece of music you use is just all you need to do is slow it down. Particularly, of course, when we're talking about non-standard music, things from uh, the radio, the CDs, whatever, uh, that you're, you're using, uh, sometimes the only way to use them effectively is by slowing them down or in some of the cases of the classical music type by speeding them up. It just depends on the piece you have. But uh, pay attention to that. <clears throat> Being aware of the musical phrase. Now, does everybody know what I mean by musical phrase? There's going to be a specific place as you hear the music where you're going to know, to, number one, to put your foot, but also when to speak. Um, now, uh, there's a, a timing sense of whether you deliver the uh, command call uh, on the uh, first or fifth beat of the music, and then uh, by doing so, the dancers take you know actually take the first beat. Uh, if you take the fifth, well, I can't count that out. I've tried. Uh, I, there was a caller in the east uh, named uh, I can't remember Dick's name, but uh, he, he was well known in, in the area in his day, and he was an absolute fanatic about this approach to music. And he played guitar when he called and so on. Leisure, thank you so much. And uh, they had asked me to come in and help them when they were doing the timing chart for advance. They didn't have an advanced caller available with me, so I came in to do that. And they were trying to time out a call named Cast the Shadow. And uh, I said, okay, folks, here's what I'm going to do to give you a heads up what's coming. I'm going to call, uh, swing two, boys run, couples circulate, cast a shadow. So when you hear me say couples circulate, right, the next call is going to be the cast of shadows, so you know when to watch them pick up their feet and start counting beats. And I would do that, and uh, Dick was like, you know, in the room, no, 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 no. you got to do it this way. And I tried, and I couldn't affect, accomplish what he wanted me to affect. And I said, uh, I don't know uh, what you really want from me. I've tried. Well, Jim Mayo had come in the back of the room and had been watching, and Jim knew my calling. And uh, Jim hollered from back, Dick, just leave him alone and let him call. It'll be fine. And so Dick kind of backed off. But before that, he said, well, let me one more try. So we're doing the one more try, and he's counting out beats. I'm watching the dancers and listening to the music. And all of a sudden, behind me, he says, now! I just turned around and looked at him, you know, and this isn't going to work. So they left me alone, and we started going. 
and we used it the way I told them to when to pick up their feet and so on. The timing came out just fine. I called several sequences that way. The dancers were decent dancers. They were moving through the call nicely. The tempo was smooth. Uh, it was comfortable. And uh, when it was all over, they got their counts and stuff. But when it was over, Dick came to me and he said, I don't understand how you can do that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, number one, I've never seen advanced called smoothly without stop and go, et cetera, for starters. But not only do you do that, but you're always exactly in the right place for people to put their foot down. How do you do that? And I told him, I said, all I can tell you, Dick, is that I just, I listen and feel the music and I watch the dancers. And that works for me. Uh, trying to count one, two, three. And after a while, if you do the counting approach, you will then come to the point where you sense it. So perhaps I'm a natural at that. I don't know. But um, that approach didn't work. But musical phrase, being able to take take the musical phrase and know when to step off on the beat of the music, you need to be able to deliver the command to the dancer so they can step off. Now, we did an experiment last year here trying to determine how important it was to do that. And uh, Jim Mayo is a big fan of that approach also, but he... Uh, he came away with it. He was on the panel. He came with it. You know, ultimately, it seems that it doesn't make that much difference in the overall dance experience, which was a surprise to, to some of the long-time callers. But um, being on the musical phrase for the dancer, it feels right to the dancer. It's right where they put their foot down. It feels good, and it lets them move. Um, so that's why I speak on that. One of the things we don't talk about in here but is that uh, I'll often ask dancers, or I'll teach dancers, I'll ask callers, do you know the difference between walking and dancing? Anybody offer an answer? Wade? Sure. When you're, when you're walking, your heel hits first. When you're dancing, your toes hit the floor first. And, uh, and that smooths things out in your in your body. I, 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 I gotta get this guy a poster or something to carry with him. Mike is doing this because that's the way Bob Osgood taught people to dance. And watch again what he's doing. I don't mean to interrupt No, no please, you, please, please. But I, I watch Bob do this with Mike as a demo. When you're walking, your posture's slightly back. Your heel hits first. You, you, you even have a different gait, but you're upright and you're kind of leaning back. Different your weights, gait. Yeah. Your weights, yeah. When you're dancing, you're slightly leaning forward, and I'd invite you to show your dancers that when you're teaching your new dancers, it's a slight forward lean. You're on the balls of your feet, and then your toe hits. It's a different sort of posture. You're able to move and execute the dance a little bit better, and you'd be a lot less tired at the end of the evening than if you're leaning back mm -hmm. and strutting through the dance right. like this. Well, do, yeah, do that first one again, Mike, and I'll we'll comment. I'll tell him, watch his shoulders. Watch what's happening as he's rotating his body that way. Now turn around and give us the other version with your toe going first. Things this one is out. This one, he's in the movie house. The other one, he's walking down Hollywood and buying. <laughs> Can I say? <laughs> Grew up in L.A. <laughs> oh, my. Um, this delivery of calls to that musical phrase that we were just talking about, you know, where you're technically supposed to deliver that um, command so the dancer is stepping on the downbeat of the music as opposed to trying to step on the upbeat. Now, we all have dancers that can't find this. I mean, I have a fellow, he's a good dancer. He knows where to go. He knows where he needs to be all the time. He's not rough. He's not abusive. He's in the square. And if he ever took a beat, a step to the music, it'd be by accident. I mean, he doesn't saunter. He just kind of moves through the square and somehow gets there. But at least he doesn't disrupt anybody else because he's where he needs to be when he needs to be there. So that part's okay. But, I mean, it's just amazing. I don't know how you can't step to the beat of the music. I mean, I don't understand, you know, and I know Italian callers have said, well, well, show us how to call off the beat of the music. I can't demonstrate that. I just can't. I, I just try it. I, I can't do that. Um, matching your music and your choreography, and the phrase here on the sheet is wind in your face or, or workshop. Of course, when we're workshopping, there's going to be more stop and go. When we're stopping to teach or to clean up a point that we see, okay, we're, some of us are having a problem with. Um, that's going to happen. But I always make sure the music that I have on in that situation is more or less background music. It's pleasant. Uh, it's not intrusive to what I'm trying to teach. I'm not trying to, when I'm workshopping, I'm not trying to lock the dancer into the feel of, of the dance. I'm workshopping to get them to understand how the physical science of the choreography works. And then I'm going to add the art in. I always believe there's both science and the art in what we do. 
and we'll add the artistic part in when we're getting them to actually move with the music or actually getting to feel it and excite it and use the music in such a way that it adds to that. Um, for example, when we have a piece of music that either has a key change, which we don't do a lot of in patter, but, uh, but when you have a key change or an elemental point in the music where it, has, it raises uh, the, the, even the music of the volume by nature changes, uh, goes up, um, that's where you want to hit your Alaman left. That's where you want to hit your right and left grand. And uh, it gives the dancers a real lift, you know. And if you're capable of calling on the upbeat for any length of time, that's a great place to put it in. Uh, I've tried. I'm not a natural at calling on the upbeat, but it, that has an element of excitement to the floor as well. But you're matching choreography there to your music. Now, I have certain calls that I reserve for flow tips, and I made a comment before about if they deserve it. You know, I want them to deserve it. I'll spend all night long developing the first thing I want to do is develop their trust and I do that through the body flow you develop trust through the body flow the dancers will get better and better they'll be more and more successful they trust you more so as a result because I do believe that body flow will make them more successful in every instance um, once I've got that and I see people are down they've come to trust me my home clubs it's, it's automatic they've learned you they know to trust you in fact if you call something that is Reverse body flow by a mistake. The wrong words came out of your mouth. You know, most of the floor of the dancers to me regularly are going to do what should have been called. They're going to do the reverse flutter wheel, not the flutter wheel that I asked for, because they know just by feel that's what needs to be there. Um, and the people that are listening to it, oddly enough, the fellow who doesn't dance to the music, he's the first one to catch it, you know, and feel like he's going to fall on his face. You know, but he'll try to make it work. You know, so. You, you look at that sort of thing uh, when you're doing this. Workshopping, I want the music to be unintrusive, but I want it to be there with a nice rhythm in the background. Uh, if I need to, need to stop periodically, as you do when we're teaching something new or workshopping a bump in the road, that's fine. But when I'm going for an all-out, straight-out flow tip, I want wind in their face. I want them excited about moving. Number one, first thing, I lower the degree of difficulty of what I'm calling. And I, and I don't care what the program is. I don't care if it's C2 or if it's mainstream. I reduce the degree of difficulty. It's all about the dance. It's not all about the choreography. The choreography is not the do-all, be-all of square dancing. And even though I call challenge, I say that to you, and I believe that. And I call the same way as much as possible at C1 and C2. It's, it's not all puzzles at those levels. For many callers, it is. It's nothing but puzzle. I like a combination. That's what they're looking for. But when I want the dancers to be excited and feeling really good about themselves and about what they're doing, I will lower the degree of difficulty. I'll put on a piece of music that they can't help but dance smoothly to. Sometimes the music can be hot. It can be. You can really be cooking on a hot piece of music that way. Sometimes it's not. Um, the Abitune Super Trooper, which has voices in it, but they are higher p enough pitch that they don't intrude people are not being able to understand your voice versus theirs um, and I call that right off the CD I make a minor a tempo adjustment and I call to it right off the CD and it's smooth I mean it is just like glass and that's what I want it to be and that's one that I reserve and as a showmanship thing folks there are times when I will tell that to the dancers I know I'm going to use it I'll say, folks, I want to tell you something. I've been watching you all night. I really enjoyed calling with you. Uh, you're, you're, you're good dancers. I want to share this with you because you've earned it. And I always get a lot of response from that. People applaud that. And I mean it genuinely. You know, because if I don't think it's going to happen, I don't put it on. But pure outflow, one thing to the another, to the another, to the another. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are resolves in there, but not as many as there would be if I have a floor that's struggling. You know, as long as they're struggling, I want to close off, get out, start fresh. So those are the things that I think are, are most valuable. That when you face that we're talking about, as much continuous motion as possible, all good flow without being overflow. If you're a caller that's highly sensitive to, to flow, your danger is overflow. For the rest of us, the, the danger would be reverse flow. Um, one of the reasons new callers always end up doing the wrong one, the boys run and bend the line, 
is because as callers, we all call boys running down the line way too much, you know, and it's and it's, it's geared into their brain. And so they're not sure what to call next, and so it's boys running bend the line. And invariably, of course, the boy was on the end, and he did a run, and the bend is an absolute reverse body flow killer. Um, and uh, you need to see that. And I'll tell you one story on myself now. I'm going to pass off to Jerry here. But when I, the way I became aware of body flow, and this is a, a particularly good story based on where we are geographically in the country because the people here are going to know who I'm talking about when it's over. I was... Uh, I've been calling for about five, six years maybe, and uh, five. And I'm calling along. It's a local festival. Um, but we had a good turnout. People traveled to come to it. And uh, it was one of the local callers, plus we had um, a feature caller who happened to be Bob Fisk that year. And uh, so I'm calling along a nice big crowd. And I called my tip, and I was very satisfied with it. And this fellow comes walking over to him and was over. I don't know who he was. He was a big, bushy beard, heavy-duty dude. And... Uh, a little intimidating looking actually and he, he comes wandering over toward me and he said uh, John I said, I said yes sir he said uh, uh, you know you, you don't want to do that I said, I'm sorry I don't understand said, you don't want to be calling that heads right and left through and re- lead it to right <laughs> and I, I, I was lucky I didn't at that point in time I didn't have the big head type thing like what are you talking about who is this guy you know I actually stopped and I thought about it and I said, oh, that's awful. I said, yeah, but you, you've called it twice in that tip. I said, oh, thank you so very much. Uh, I really appreciate it uh, and I'll pay a lot more attention. And I did from that point on. It happened to be John Sabalski of all people. <laughs> uh, that, that being said, I had learned my lesson. So uh, please keep, keep, the, uh, keep body flow, especially close to your heart. Uh, and your music selection even more so. Uh, when we talk about, I, I always say this in the sneak peek panel, you, you spend, uh, you know, how much time do you spend selecting you know, your pattern music, which is going to be, you know, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minute tip, whatever a pattern. Don't you think you should spend just as much time selecting your singing calls rather than just putting them on? Selecting the ones that really speak to you and that type of thing. They're, they're, they're only four minutes, right? But they should they should deserve uh, more attention in how you select them. And with that, I'll hand over to Jerry Jones. Give a nice hand to John. For those of you that didn't know John Sobolski, I could see that would be a rather imposing figure in front of you. Um this is, is something dear to my heart to talk about smooth dancing and body flow, and I kind of threw this together. John touched on the music, and music is so vitally important. Mike, you want to run that thing? Just make sure it's set. Music is vitally important. All of my stuff is set to 126 beats of music, but your music has to talk to you. And for different parts of your evening, and This thing is brand new. Elmer just cut this. But what it does, it talks to you, and you can just call smooth flow with this, like to open a dance with. Bow to the partner, corner to the circle of the left, go around, you do the circle of the left. And you get people's feet to move, and that's the idea. When you're starting a dance, you want to develop trust, and so you want music that just lets them move along. And you can just call to it. And uh, I, I honestly believe that it's not what we call, but how we call it. How we present it. Presentation to me is so important to dancers' success. And I would use something like that, say, to start a dance with. And then John talked about your workshop tip. Maybe you go with something like this. That's just a steady old hoedown. But it doesn't get in your way. Music sets the tone for whatever you're going to do as far as choreography is, is included. And you need to think about your music for what part of the dance it is. And also, John, we talked about music, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But when we're talking about smooth dancing, it's, it's moving from one call to the next with a smooth flowing action and having the proper hand available at a time. I don't know how many of you think about this, but with the exception of star through for the gals, which is the left, 
and in left alaman almost every call we call starts with the right hand followed by a left hand almost all of them there are probably some exceptions but think about that and so when you call a call if you're going to use the right hand then you need to be thinking about what to do with that left hand a long time before you get there because that's what makes flow work it's hand availability and how do we do that and if you're going to do something that's a little more difficult how are you going to help them uh, for instance if I do some uh, cast offs from ocean waves and you can make that smooth and people think well you can't do it but you can hit square through and you get to four to count to four get around the ring and when you get done touch a quarter make a new wave centers trade swing through cast right three quarters till the girls touch the girls trade swing through and the boy run around a girl the helper words and notice I set it up so the girls when you cast the girls touch so I could talk to people cast three quarters till the girls touch if you, you had a boy and a girl touch you can't talk to them as well now you can do that later on in your tip but to set it up you want to set it up if you want to use the boys as a center you do that swing through and uh, then maybe a scoot back centers trade swing through cast off three quarters till the boys touch and the boys trade but you have to know that in, in your head you have to know ahead of time what you're going to do and who you're going to talk to and to be prepared for that next call boys trade it's it's about momentum about smooth body flow about hand usage may I interject right there and one other element that comes into that is our, our word metering when you have some calls that need to be delivered together you know it is not double pass through track two it's double pass through track two exactly it's pass through trade by you know, and those kinds of metering, uh, tying your, your meeting of your words, you know, to the music makes a major, major difference. Yes, Any other question? Uh, Silicon Valley, uh, I'm going to address your comment about the double pass through because I'm hearing impaired and so are a lot of dancers these days. Um, what you're talking about is absolutely correct by the double pass through track two if it weren't for the fact that the vast majority of dancers these days do the triple clap. And if you try calling a call during the triple clap, it's a lot harder for the dancers to hear it, and I absolutely hate the callers who do that. I actually hate dancers who do the triple clap, so we're even. <laughs> this is off the subject, but on the subject, because what he's talking about, a lot of people are doing this woo-woo, things like that. We have to understand the age group of the people we have. Now, you're hearing me impaired, but a lot of people have hearing aids. And these load-the-boat horns and things like that really bother people that have hearing aids. And we need to think of that, about that and be cognizant of it. When you're teaching your classes, it's something you need to bring up, not because you need to tell the class that, but you need to let your angels know. But you can't tell the angels unless you tell the class. Do you get, you get what I mean? Yeah. You get to everybody without saying, you idiot, don't do that again. That's that's what I mean. It's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're a way driver. You can do that, and I can't. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the whole point of this is is preparation. I believe in modules. I don't think I, I'm not a big believer in site resolution. Now, I, I, I call by site. Don't get me wrong. I resolve by site. But everything I do is a module with a plan like that cast three quarters touch a quarter centers trade now I got a boy boy girl girl swing through now I got a girl boy or boy girl boy girl cast three quarters till the girls touch girls trade swing through I know exactly what I have I know if I run the boys bend the line right and left through I'm a square through three from an element I know all of that that's planned choreography and everything I do is that way also you have to have you ever gone to a dance and you wind up with your right leg hurting? The reason is all you went is right. So you need to have some dancing that takes you other place. Swing through, boys run, couple circulate, chain down the line, and you change that flow. Uh, chain down the line, ladies lead Dixie style. Change that flow, boys trade, left swing through, girls run, couple circulate. 
changing the flow so that it feels like dancing. Now, that doesn't mean that you go a couple circulate chain down the line. Ladies lead Dixie style. You know when you do that chain down the line, if you're going to do a ladies lead Dixie style, or if you're going to do a star through. You know that before you start. Okay, John? Uh, only this, that uh, you can make up a whole list of helper words. Like he said, you know, uh, what was the helper word you just used? Girls to, uh, touch, right? Girls touch, girls I, trade. I use when you meet. Boys, when you meet, start a left swing through, or whatever it happens to be I'm calling. But it's really critical to note what he said and how he set it up, because the, the cast all three quarters that he wanted, but was really critical to normalize the most normal situation he would have would be a standard wave, boys in the end, girls in the middle. So that touch a quarter was vital that he put in there to be able to change things. And, you even, and he mentioned in your wave, he actually said that while you were calling letting them know that's where they are. So you're giving dancers a reassurance at that point of where they are, and you're also making sure of where they are for your sake as well. And helper words are vital. It really is. And what it does, it changes the dancer focus when you say in your wave. Same thing, if, you know, how many have called touch, uh, square through four, hit square through four, touch a quarter, split circulate. And watch the dancers go down. I don't do that, and I'm over cautious. Don't get me wrong. I I lean to the side of being over cautious. But if I'm going to do that the first time in the dance, I'll say scoot back, then split circulate, because by doing that scoot back, I change their focus from a wave to a box. <laughs> Next time I can say touch a quarter and split circulate because it's in their mind. Any time we ask the dancers to reevaluate whether they're working in a wave or a box, it, it raises the degree of difficulty exponentially. They are not used to that. They're not used to thinking that way. You know, you call couples circulate, they're thinking about the line they're in. They're not thinking about the fact there's also a box in the square at that point in time. And thus, you need to be really cautious about doing that. We need to do that. It's important to do. But you need to be aware. You can warn the dancers. This will keep them from breaking down because change you know, that, that relocation situation that goes on, that reevaluation, really makes a difference in the degree of difficulty. The one thing that I want to emphasize, too, just getting back to helper words, is please don't let your helper words get in the way of your timing. Because that, the, being able to deliver the call, and, and you've still got those helper words that you're hanging on to, and they're standing there waiting for the next call. You don't let those helper words get in the way. So it's sometimes it's the choice of helper words and the way you say them to allow them to execute the next call without stopping. Does that make sense? Like the touch a quarter, scoot back, then split circulate. And I realize I'm overcautious, but I, uh, as a professional caller, as a full-time caller, I need to get hired back. I really do, and I, and I don't say that to be a joke. Uh, I want to be hired back, and if they have success all evening, I guarantee you I'll be hired back. Uh, and and that's your focus, and the focus isn't on whether you want the dancers to be able to dance to you and to feel like they can. And when they do that, they will have a good dance experience, and you can tell whether it's a good dance or not. See how many squares are on the floor when the dance is over. That tells you all you need to know. John just had back surgery, so sit down, John. He also needs to go to the bathroom, which I probably shouldn't have on the tape, but he's going to wait till we're done. <laughs> test, test. I, I think it's amazing that John's here yeah. after just having back surgery. Yeah. John, thank we're, you for we're very pleased for to coming have through. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, again, body flow is so important and hand usage and what I just talked about. Being aware of what you're looking for. Being aware of where you're going to go with this activity. Uh, over rotation, there's a singing call figure that is on a lot of singing call records where they recycle and swing the girl. I just hate that call because if you think about it, that lady has just turned 360 and she's going to turn another 360 when you swing her and another 360 when you twirl her. Think about it. Now, you can get away from that very simply. Instead of saying recycle, boys cross-fold, swing. 
being aware of what you're doing. A perfect example that we don't think about. Use, use the call, spin chain and exchange the gears for those that are calling plus. I use that as a, as a key example here. And what's the last thing that happens for the centers? Is a cast off three quarters, right? When you meet, right? Spin chain, yeah, no, I'm sorry, spin chain the gears, right? And the last thing that happens is to cast three quarters for the centers. And invariably, the next call is all right, circulate. Now you've taken that one dance route, do the three quarter turn, and you're asking them to turn two more quarters, that's a five quarter turn. And I've watched callers use that and then other things on top of it. Uh, then you just grind that dancer, a couple of the dancers, down into the floor. Now, with body flow, usually you're okay. Occasionally, you may have a situation where two people can't feel as good about it as the rest. But otherwise, it should be for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, as, as, as a man, when you're calling, you need to think about what's the lady doing. Because the lady, like in my example, she turned 360 degrees twice or three times. And sometimes some will say, well, it's just two of the dancers, two of the eight dancers. But, boy, it's still, those two dancers are still there to dance, too. So they're still yeah. feeling it, too. And what if the lady has a little trouble with vertigo and stuff like that? You need to be cognizant of those things. That's part of smooth. <laughs> Wade, Driver, <laughs> Wade Driver for the tape just said they should deduct 25% of the fee. And my reply to you is, who asked you? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we're talking about it isn't what you call, it's how you call it. And it's called preparation. If you're going to do something in a tip, you want to prepare for it. If you want to do the cast three quarters, then you prepare for it. Think about what you're doing. Wade and I were talking about a call a little while ago, and it's an advance, so I won't go there. But the whole point was the setup. Maybe I should wait. Should I say? I, I don't know how many are using Motivate, just so you know what it is. It's a call on the advanced list. And I was going to play with uh, uh, Enroll Mo Motivate. And all you do is you replace the first cir all eight circulate with Enroll Circulate. The point is you can't call that from a boy, girl, girl, boy wave because they won't do it. You have to set it up so you have a boy, boy, girl, girl wave because when you do the in-roll circulate, they're normal and they finish like a motivate. It's not what you call, it's how you call it. If you don't know what in-roll circulate means for that setup he was talking about, the end dancer looking in circulates straight across the square and the other people in the wave roll down, flip over one spot in his direction. And you have a normal that, wave. And that gives you the normal wave. You need to know that to understand the example. But the point point is, for smooth dancing, you have to set that up because if you call it any other way, they can't do it. They just, I don't care how good they are. They're going to have, they're going to struggle with that. So you think about it ahead of time. How am I going to accomplish this? And get it in your mind as to what you do to set up I replaced Burl Main down here in, in Mesa when when Burl passed away, and Kerry was kind enough to give me his notes, which was just, <laughs> you, th you think? Uh, and what amazed me, I wasn't around Burl very much. I d did a couple of tips with him, and I was surprised to have been asked to do this. But when I got to looking at the notes, I was amazed at how similar we thought because Burl set stuff up just like what I'm talking about. And it just kind of reinforced my philosophy about calling it. It was a very interesting thing to go through those notes. It really was. Guys, this stuff that you're getting right now is so valuable, especially if you've only been calling a few years and haven't heard some of these things. I went to a number of caller schools, you know, 100 years ago when I started, and this stuff was never touched on. This kind of stuff never came up back then. And it's so valuable to making you a successful caller. Please take this stuff to heart. Yeah, it's really important. So, and, and so when you create a module, think about what uh, Flippo had a famous saying. And, and there's a lot of Flippoisms around. Most of them you can't repeat in public. Uh, however, Flippo said, you know, when you call DVD, you put two boys together, two girls together. He said, you can't leave people half sashayed or two girls together or two boys together more than three calls because you won't have to fix it. They will. <laughs> and he's right. He's right. So when you think about doing anything, think about 
how do I set this up so that it's simple enough that everybody can get it, but when I finish it, are we normal so they're comfortable? And that's the important thing. They're comfortable. It isn't about us. It's about them. And to make them comfortable, and it's how you set it up. Uh, back there, the gentleman sitting back there, he took down a whole bunch of stuff I did because of that very thing. Uh, but it's something you think about consciously. And even if you're going to do a new workshop call, the first thing I look at is what does a call do? But then I look at how do I need to make that call flow? How do I need to set it up? Or do I need a preparatory tip, to tip before, to work on some things that will set that call up? That's how you make smooth body flow. Thinking ahead, thinking about what am I going to do? And what hands are going to be available? What can you do after the call? You're going to do the same thing, or can you do something else? Can you vary it without making it difficult? I always like to think you want to call different without being difficult. That's kind of my philosophy. Mike? Jerry. Takes a minute. Takes a minute. I agree with Jerry about that. He's talking not only about setting the dancers up with with the type so it's flowing, but setting them up so that they succeed. And when you call a sequence and you look down and you realize that floor is just not getting it, they're breaking down, they're having a problem, instead of looking down at that floor and thinking these guys aren't very good dancers or who taught them to dance or whatever, start looking at yourself and go, how could I have called that just a little bit differently? How could I have set it up a little bit differently so those dancers could succeed? And that analysis coming back to yourself will make you really stop and rethink some of the ways that you might call and present certain things when you call. It really it, it really helps to just turn it around and just say for a minute, how could I have made that more successful? Mike, can I jump in there? Yes. Is okay, Jerry? Please. Um, what I've seen happen, uh, we get this uh, unintended consequences occur uh, often in the world, but when we set up the uh, and, and develop the standard applications document, which is a wonderful document for new callers. The purpose of that document was to show newer callers how they can be more successful in the calls that they put together and how they present them. And that's a wonderful tool. But we're now seeing almost everybody I see across the country are teaching only to that point, the standard applications point. And if you veer off of that, you're going to start losing dancers. And I don't care where you are. So if you're going to change, you really need to look at how you're going to make them more successful. And you may find to your surprise that they still have trouble because they've gotten it burned in one way. And I think it's so critical in our teaching. I don't want you to try to teach them APD if there is such a thing, okay? Everything is by definition. I prefer the term extended application after the standard application. And if you're going to change from that standard application, you need to make sure you know how to get them there, whether it means walking them or at least changing some element of it. Um, I had a bad experience on uh, the West Coast. I went into a room. I thought it was going to be a strong floor, 18 squares, and I, was going to, I wanted to call spin chain and exchange the gears. And I danced them right to a zero box, and I stepped at a wave, uh, center straight, spin chain, exchange the gears. Okay, it was no problem. The girls were out on the end now after the swing half. Next time I did it, I did a swing through and then spin chain and exchange the gears. Put the boys out on the end. I dropped 18 squares. 18 squares down. I said, well, surely I must have. I, I said something wrong. They, didn't, they, listen, they surely couldn't have missed that. So I called to the end, and I did a lot better. I only dropped 16 squares. <laughs> we did not call that again the rest of the night other than one way. And, uh, and it wasn't a dance situation where I could do a workshop. It was on the, on the coast, my understanding out there is that a dance is a dance is a dance, not a workshop. So uh, I left it alone, but I had to look back at myself in that circumstance. But I do think uh, there's too many callers that are not showing them that it's a, a doable more than one way. You know, you know, even if it's only just half sachet where they're used to think, we use that term, but where we're used to think being on the other side. Uh, because that's... Uh, that's vital. You're trying to make these dancers be more successful and feel more competent uh, when you're teaching them. So show them more than one way, but don't try to show them everything. Not only that, but he was talking about setting them up. Big thing is, can you get them out quick? Can you get them normal? Can you get them normal? 
I learned something from Flippo. I learned a lot of things from Flippo. Uh, most of them I can't talk about. I watched him at Kirkwood Lodge one time call a boy, boy, girl, girl, relay the deuce, and it was just slick. I mean, he just, boy, move up, hook on to a boy, girl, hook on to a girl. I thought, man, that's slick. So I came back here to Mesa, and I thought I'd do this at my workshop. And I called it, and it, I did it about three times, and I think, you know, maybe I just move on to something else. So I thought about it all week, and then it hit me. It wasn't what he called. It's how he called it. I had a girl, girl, boy, boy, wave. He had a boy, boy, girl, girl, wave. Boys are used to coming off of that wave and walking all the way down. The girls aren't. The next time I called it, I didn't even have to walk it. I said, boy, hook on to a boy. Girl, hook on to a boy. Or girl, boom. Wasn't what he called. It's how he called it. How he called it. And it's a good lesson to learn. It's kind of like what Wade and I were talking about today about that in Rule Motivate. Uh, it's little things that make the difference. It's not the big things. It's little things. But keep in mind, all this time you've got this music going, and you're going to do this to that music. So that has to be in your mind what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and, and what, uh, what music you want to use. Music that talks to you and talks to them without getting in the way, and especially on, on your hoedowns, uh, so that you can can bow to the partner, corner to the circle to the left, and get your voice with that, and then their feet go with that. Alaman left with the old left hand, a hundred to the right, and a right left grand. Whatever you want to do. Heads promenade halfway around the ring, you go leap to the right, and a right left through, and a turn that girl butt. Veer to the left, couple circulate, chain down the line, whatever you do. But you have to know in your mind what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And if you're going to vary it, you don't want to do head square through four, all, four hands all night. And I fall into that habit down here in Mesa because I'm teaching all the time. And so I have to kind of break myself of that habit when I get back out on the road. But little things make the difference. And hand availability... Uh, on a Dixie style, how many people have trouble you call a Dixie style and see all the boys trying to go with the right hand? Well, sometimes, and, and I just did a dance with Mike. We did a new collar dance in L.A., and we had more fun. I don't know if they had as much fun as we did, but <laughs> but, but it, it was really fun. And they, they hiccuped a little bit on this Dixie style. So at a dance like that, you can get away with this. And I just had the head square through four, touch a quarter, scoot back. Boys fold behind the girl. And I said, you know, everything we do in dancing starts a right hand followed by a left hand. Girls, shake right hands. What hand's available to you? The boy is now standing right behind her. Ladies, tr pull, uh, ladies pull by with the right, left touch a quarter, end of call. Boys, you're standing behind the girl. So I said, then you call a little bit, do that a few times, and then I say, now... I, I get them in the lines right and left through, and I said, boys, are you standing behind the girls? Say no. And they all say no, and I said, that's a good answer. So when you hear ladies lead Dixie style, you don't stand there. You slide behind the girl. It's called counter dancing, but slide behind the girl, and your left hand will work every time. And Mike watched me do it, and he did it as well. And before we, we did, what, two sequences, I'd say right and left through, boys slide behind her, ladies lead Dixie style. Doesn't get in the way at all. We never had anybody break down. And the other way we added, I just added a little dilly to the end of that, we'll say boys high five. So when those guys come into the middle, I want them to high five right there in the middle. And it gets the guys, boom, they're, that's they're, a, that's that right California hand thing. is together, you know. And if you have them a high five, if even no matter, no matter what happens with that left hand, if they're, oh, that first time they high five, they're going to look for that when they Dixie Helper style. words. Yeah. yeah. Helper words. And, and I had not thought of that, but it was a very good technique because he said high five, and they did that. And it, it's a real good way. The rest of the way and, through. Again, they it's have. not what we call. It's how we call it. What yeah, that, that, was, that was from you, Rod, wasn't it? It was. It was from Rod Shooping in the back. Thank you, Rod, very okay. much. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Mike maybe has some more to add to this, but do, do we make sense? Are there questions from you? Uh, the other thing that I notice people doing is when when the, the couples get back home, how many guys are standing around a while? When I got people home, I'll say heads, and I'm ready to go. And everybody said, "Boy, you call fast." No, I just don't stop. 
I don't stop. It's continuous flow. It, what, we have gotten so intrigued with choreography, we forgot that it's a dance. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to get that through to everybody, but that dance part of it is the preparation part. It's the thought that you made before you got to the dance, that this is how you work. And if you want to call it a little differently, the cast off three quarter from waves, set it up so that it dances. And understand then that you're going to be across the street when you get done. John? Right from the beginning, when we start teaching our dancers as, as new dancers, of course we have to stop more often. They need that extra time to orient and sense. And we do that, but we add in, you know, there's the difference between the definition and the cue. And they develop, we teach them the definition, then we give them a cue, which is a shortened version of the call. You know, the right and left through, and right pull by, stick out the left in a courtesy turn type thing is one that I, I use as a cue to that point. Eventually, of course, I take the cue away. But there's something else we have to learn to take away. We need to learn to take away the stop. We need to learn. Need we need to learn to teach the dancers how to dance. What's called stacked calls, right? And I'm not. You can only stack but so far ahead of them. You don't want to confuse them. You don't want them to ask them to remember four calls or anything like that. But eventually, that crutch that we've given them, that extra time, that stopping time, we need to begin to take it away a little at a time to where now all of a sudden they can do the right and left through and the ladies chain right together, you know, into the flutter wheel, into the whatever. But you begin to do that stacking because you're going to need it later. But we get into later and somehow we were fine up to this point and then somehow we start to keep the crutch in place. Now, there are some callers that stop after every call because they're not sure what to call next. That's not sight calling, that's human checkers. You know, which is not a good thing, right? But I think it's really, really important. Uh, and the business about Gary talking about being fast versus, you know, not stopping. That's a perfect example. And, and I'll, you know, I won't name names, but, you know, I'll go behind a caller who is notoriously uh, known for using really fast music, like I may have mentioned before, but he doesn't call to the music, right? So the dancers are dancing to him, and he stops. He gives them a lot of stops. I come in, I'm much slower much, much slower tempo, but I don't stop. I'm consistent, and I'm considered the fast one. Yeah. He's too fast you know, for me. You need The dancers need to learn how to do that because if it's not continuous movement, it's not dance anymore. Yeah. Right. Now, that doesn't mean this continuous movement thing doesn't mean that there's not time for something like an asymmetric sequence or something that might be a little bit different for the dancer to give just a little change of pace so that they're not just walking to the beat all night long. For them to breathe. Yeah, it's a little bit of breathe time. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you completely eliminate that. You sprinkle that stuff in for variety and variation. But when they're dancing, let them dance. And as John said, when you're taking away those helper words, you're giving them the music. You're letting them dance to the music. Right. Make the music so much a part of what you do. And when you back off those helper words and you're just giving them the commands and helping them flow through, use a piece of music that just lets them dance. Two, two calls that come to mind that you need to think about to handle the person not active. Uh, Dixie style to a wave puts the boys in the center. And I, a lot of times I do boys cross run, ladies slide together, ladies trade. I do that because the girls need some flow, and they've just used a right hand. They need a left hand. They need that left hand. The other one that just kills me, and I see this all the time, head square through four, touch a quarter, follow your neighbor and spread, swing through. Oh, I hate that. Now, I know what the guys are thinking about, because they do touch a quarter, follow your neighbor and spread, they have a zero box. But the girls' hands are begging to trade in the middle, so ladies trade. So. What's your hurry to get to the box? Swing through, boys run, bend the line, pass the ocean, you got a box. And everybody got to dance. But those little things, if that girl just come to the center, that hand is begging to be used. Alternate the hands. It makes sense? Makes, yeah, makes sense. The dancers will do it. The dancers commonly will do this stuff. But uh, the dancers will, will make up for us a lot. And, uh, and sometimes we just don't need to do that. Any comments? Comments from anybody? Things that, that may or pet peeves or things that get to you or whatever. Wade? Here comes Wade Driver. 
I have the way drivers bring tickets. I have one complaint. When Burl died, he left you his notes. He left me a case of candy that was so bad even the dancers wouldn't take it for free. <laughs> I will share those with you, Aid. <laughs> you still have that case I of candy. I do have <laughs> it. I didn't get any candy, but I've been giving Shoemakes candy to everybody for years. <laughs> And he left Mesa how long ago? I don't know. He's still complaining about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Anybody else comments? Yes. Yes, Lisa. Please. Lisa Lincoln, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've wondered, using patter with words, because you talked about Super Trooper, how much of that can you do? I'll take it since I brought it up. Um, I think there's a limited amount uh, that fits uh, into a like give an evening. Uh, the idea here is that be careful in the music you select. Generally, if you're a male caller, you want to use something that has mostly female voices in it, that higher range, or a male like a Ricky Skagg, some of his stuff, his bluegrass stuff, dances really well. Uh, uh, what is it, 40 Highway 40 Blues, I think that is. That, that one works quite well. But the idea is just differentiation for the dancer. They've got to understand who the caller is and who the background words or noise is coming from. And you want that to be kept at a minimum. So it's going to be very cautious there. Um, if it's a female caller, obviously, then what you want is, you know, something lower that you're going to be able to cut through with your higher pitch voice uh, going through it. So that's the first part of how you, how you choose uh, for that so the dancers don't get confused. We have a... There's a call that's now been converted to a square dance version called Two Times, but it was by uh, Leanne, Leanne, that was the name of the artist, and uh, of course, in hers, the words are in there, and the words are two times, and you really don't want them to hear them square through two times, you know, uh, you know, so keep in mind, you know, that type of thing can actually happen, uh, but the square dance version is quite good, and uh, it works, right? little boop boop in the back. There you go. This dances really, really beautifully, and it is a pop piece. Um, and we get no words. Now, let's use another example that I'm hoping you have over there, Jerry. Um, on the call, um, Tennessee Waltz has been popular recently. And uh, the way we first got onto it was a German artist lady who, uh, who I've seen the video of her actually. She is a packaged product, let me tell you, top to bottom. I mean, clothes, hair, style, everything. And she's out strutting her stuff in, in this video uh, through a, a beer garden. And she's singing Tennessee Waltz. But it's an up version of Tennessee Waltz with her voice in it and in German, no less, right? Which, of course, that somewhat helps our dancers. But it might confuse the Germans, trying to use, use us versus them versus the, the, the song. But then uh, it came out on another version, another label, uh, JRR, I believe is the name of the label, and uh, they have it, and without voices, and they're both good, but the one that they did with the original, with the voice in it, uh, the difference is it has a drive to it, you can really drive and push, and the other one's more of a relaxer, for but both cases for pattern, and uh, you know, it, it's interesting how you choose, and when you use them, I have both, I tend to use the square dance version more often, uh, but I have a friend of mine, good caller. He tends to do the opposite. He uses the driver more often. Uh, I pick and choose for the, the environment that I'm in, what I'm trying to do. But it's uh, cautious right there is the main key in terms of how your voice will compare to the voices on the piece of music you're selecting. I probably wouldn't do more than two a night, I would think, at the most uh, for from, from my dancers. Uh, I, I always think that's, that's generally the case. I don't know about the other two fellows. Wait. Yeah, and I totally agree with John. You have to be really judicious in selecting, and which is a really hot button mind. Learn the song, play that thing. For example, I used to think with BGs, which is the same thing. He's singing the key of Z sharp there someplace, but uh, well, nobody has voice up. But he did do a song called Dancing. All right, it's a little raucous. But you need to learn where he's going to say dancing. So you can do your thing and do a right and left grand, and they'll be dancing and let him sing to them. You know, so if you're going to use a song with vocals, learn it. Cole, know who's going to say, or the, uh, -do -do, -do, the last, last, whatever that thing was with the, yeah, no, no, the, uh, oh, that crazy one, lost last something, last, whatever it is, it has that, what is 
last night. That, that last night. That thing gets raucous. I work with those guys but he, before he died, and it, he gets really weird in there. But you can use it if you know where the passages are. There's a number of versions of last night also, quite a few different versions of that out there. And I have one that doesn't have the voices in it, and uh, it's karaoke piece, and it works really, really well. But you're right. You can get carried away with it. The dancers love it. But if you know where that is, and you can set it up and do it search away, it really gets their attention. Yeah. Particularly if you're in Louisiana where they're crazy to with. Uh, Silicon Valley, I will again speak as a hearing impaired person, and yep. I never like music with vocals in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and he has a good point there. He does. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do use a lot of pop music. Um, for example, Uptown Funk is one that a lot of my dancers will always congratulate me for. But what I do is I get the karaoke version. Be careful with karaoke. A lot of them have backing vocals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what you want to do is look for the instrumental version. Yes of the piece, and that will get you the one without any vocals. Yep, I agree. Okay. Other questions? Yes, there's a young lady back there. You keep talking about, like, karaoke and different things. How does that affect our BMI ASCAP situation? If you buy the record, if you buy the song, it doesn't affect you at all. Yeah. You've paid for the music. doesn't matter where it came from, as long as you have a record that you indeed paid for the music. Perhaps. Yes, yes, I just that leads me into that. Um, but I don't really do a commercial. Just, just the bottom line about uh, about our music is make sure you're managing it and acquiring it and managing it the right way. And uh, and everybody, member of Caller Lab, should belong to the Guild of Pride by stating the fact that you manage and you muse to your peers that you manage and that you handle your music in an ethical manner. And that's why the Guild of Pride is there. It's just, it's just so we can all tell each other then st that we're standing on both of our feet and we're managing our music in a legal and an ethical manner. Any other questions? There's one, one other point that I wanted to make, and it's, it's about that giving that dancer that one beat of music in the way you call. It can't always happen, but when you can do it, pick me out a singing call or something. It can't always happen, but when you can do it, if you can deliver the command before the one beat and give that dancer the one beat, you will enhance their dancing experience. And they won't know why. A lot of them won't know why. It just feels better and smoother. But you'll know why, and those dancers will, will end up enjoying the dance. Folded his chain across You turn and chain him back Circle left now One, two, three, four, five, six All I'm in a left your corner And you weave the ring One, two, three Can't make old friends Can't make old friends It was you and me Since way back when Friends hit square through its four. One, two, three, four. Notice he didn't wait for it. He said it right Swing away. Swing through and then, boy, trade. Boy, run right. Bend the line up to the middle and back. And I want to let through and turn the girl and then. The giving him that first beat when you when you start out. We'll finish the, the line. Everybody sing along. Nice piece, Wade. Well, it was you and me since way back when. But you can't make old friends. It's promenade have a way. And again, notice there was no way. Six down the middle of the square through four. One, two, three, four, five, six. And around a left through. Fear left and Ferris wheel. We use that figure a lot because it times out really well and it gives them the one beat. But the key is, is on that. When you start your figure, if you can do it, that's why we say circle left and then they give them the one beat. That's why we say sides face, grand square, boom, you give them that one right. beat there. Two quick things, Mike. One is that uh, you notice in there he did the Alaman left and weave. That's your stacking right there so that he didn't have to get in the way of it and didn't have to get in the way of the music and get in the way of taking that first beat. Now, Mike, would you demonstrate for us how to do it with a patter piece? Because you get to the point sometimes on a pattern, but you got to use a well phrased pattern piece yes, too. Absolutely, it's always it's always good. Yeah. But the the key is is giving them that one beat. Um, a way to practice that, by the way, is some of the contra type music that helps a you. A simple get thing beat. like this. Yeah, start again. Yeah. 
Four ladies chain, two, three, four, five. You chain a lady back, two, three, four. A circle and you go around the one, two, three, four. Do it all about a left and come Watch by the feet. Do it around a left grand, three, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two. It's the musical phrase, and you're actually delivering Hits. the call on the five, six, seven, and eight, somewhere in there to give them that one beat. It can't always happen, but when you can do that, it really makes a big, big difference. But notice that music made you pick your feet up. Music is really important. Uh, I want you to thank Mike for hosting this thing. Thanks, Dan, for Mr. Jerry Junk. John Marshall, and Very good. on behalf of all of us who've been Caller Lab members for a long time, we appreciate you coming to the convention, and we hope that you get something out of it that's useful and will help your calling and your clubs. We thank you for your support. Thanks, yes. guys. Yes. Thank you.